Welcome. I'm Don Vino, president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc., and we thank you for joining us on this online event, The Enneagram, What's True, What's False, and Does It Matter? The Enneagram has captured the imagination of Christians and churches around the world since its introduction into the Evangelical Church in 2016, with Suzanne Stabile and Ian Cron's IVP book, The Road Back to You. It has sold over 750,000 copies so far. Christopher Huertz followed up in 2017 with The Sacred Enneagram, and in 2018, Suzanne Stabile's book, The Path Between Us, came out. These three titles combined have sold nearly a million copies. Currently, there are over 40 pro Enneagram books by Christian publishers on the market. Pastors use the Enneagram for nine-week sermon series. The Enneagram has become a, quote, tool, end quote, for discipling, marriage counseling, church membership, classes, and other spiritual disciplines. Baylor University offers an Enneagram certificate program with well over a million Christians involved in Enneagram on some level, it seems appropriate to ask a few questions. What is the Enneagram? Where did it come from? Is it an ancient tool or something invented in the 20th century? Is it a Christian tool or a psychological tool? Does it make claims about God and his creation? Over the next few days, we'll be looking at these and other questions. To start us off, I would like to introduce Justin Peters, his presentation, Trading Sola Scriptura for Prima Scriptura, really forms the basis for how each of us will determine if the Enneagram is a helpful tool for Christians, harmful to Christians, or simply neutral on a spiritual level. Is Scripture the final authority for faith and practice, or is it ancient wisdom and non-biblical practices on a par with, or perhaps superior to, Scripture? Justin is a sound Bible teacher, speaker, and popular YouTube podcaster. He was born and reared in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Justin earned his undergraduate at Mississippi State University in 1995, and then a Master of Divinity and Master of Theology in 2000 and 2002, respectively, from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Justin met his bride, Kathy, at an evangelism conference near Los Angeles, California in 2009. They are married in 2010, August. From 2014 until 2019, they lived in Sand Point, Idaho, and were members of the Kootenai Community Church. They now, along with their little dog, Mia, reside in Bozeman, Montana, and are members of Grace Bible Church. At least Justin and Kathy are members, but according to Justin, Mia has not yet been able to give a credible profession of faith. We are blessed to have him lead off the event and trust you will be blessed as well. We also believe many will be challenged. Please pray for each one of us and all of those who will watch these and other sessions. Invite others you know to join us. This is an important question. Is the Enneagram Christian or is it something else? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that you and your family are doing well today. And I want to thank you so much for joining me for this presentation. It's a great honor and privilege to have been asked to participate in this online conference dealing with the Enneagram. And the Enneagram was largely unknown in evangelical circles until about six or seven years ago. And then it just exploded onto the evangelical scene. And now we have evangelical churches that are teaching this in Sunday school classes, in small groups, and many evangelical churches are even teaching the Enneagram from the pulpit. Now, other presenters in this conference will do a very able job in showing you the history of the Enneagram and what it actually teaches. They will do a deep dive into the nuts and bolts of the Enneagram and show you why it is so dangerous. That is not my task here. My task in my presentation is to just give you kind of an overview of the, the broad issue at hand, and that is the difference between sola scriptura and prima scriptura. I'm going to talk about why it's so dangerous to use extra biblical sources of revelation or extra biblical sources of supposed truth 
to aid us in our growth in Christ, in our uh, maturation as Christians, uh, our progressive sanctification. So why is it so dangerous to use extra biblical sources to aid us in that? And that is exactly what the Enneagram is. And so I'm going to define sola scriptura and prima scriptura, and then I'm going to show you some biblical support for the former, sola scriptura, and then I'm going to show you some video clips of a pastor of a very large evangelical church in California as he and his wife are doing an interview basically about the Enneagram. And I'm going to take some clips from that interview and I'm going to let you see uh, how this pastor views uh, the Enneagram and what he believes it can do for us as Christians. And then I'm going to comment on some of the things he says. All right, so uh, without, with that, in the, um, just as by way of introduction, now let's look at these terms and define them. Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura, that is a Latin phrase that literally means alone scripture or scripture alone. It is the belief that scripture is the sole and only authority for Christian theology and Christian practice. It holds that the Bible is not only authoritative, but it is also sufficient. The Bible is sufficient for everything that we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Sola Scriptura also holds that God reveals himself through and only through Scripture. There is no other means by which God gives to us specific revelation. He reveals himself to us in Scripture alone. There's no other means of revelation, of, of specific revelation, other than the Word of God, Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura is, to the, is the position to which I hold. It was a rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation back in the 16th century. Uh, so that is to be contrasted in my presentation with Prima Scriptura. Prima Scriptura is also a Latin phrase, and Prima Scriptura is the belief that Scripture is not the only way that God reveals himself, but merely the first way or the primary, the prima, primary way in which God reveals himself. Scripture is the first among other sources of divine revelation. So prima scriptura will not necessarily reject Scripture. It doesn't say that the Bible is not valuable. It doesn't even say that the Bible is not the Word of God. Uh, it just says that there are also other sources of revelation. God reveals himself in other ways as well. Scripture just kind of being the, the first and foremost, but these other sources can also benefit us. And so to help you kind of understand of what I am speaking, I want to give you a couple of modern examples of prima scriptura. One would be the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church uh, does not believe in sola scriptura. They believe in prima scriptura. They would say that scripture is the primary way that God reveals himself. It's the primary source of authority. But we also have the Roman Catholic magisterium. We also have church tradition. Church tradition is authoritative as well. Uh, papal bulls, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra or from the chair, that is also authoritative. In fact, when the Pope speaks uh, ex cathedra, that is in fact infallible. They believe that the Pope speaks with the authority of God himself. And so uh, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't reject scripture, but they'd say, yeah, we're going to take scripture and we're going to add these other things along with it. And we hold these other things to the same authoritative level as that of scripture. Now, I should say the Roman Catholic Church does reject scripture in other ways because they redefine grace, but that's for another conference, not this one. So uh, that's one example of prima scriptura. Another example of prima scriptura would be the Mormon church. So Mormons who used to never call themselves Christian, but now they do, uh, they would say, well, yes, oh yes, we believe in the Bible. The Bible is the word of God, but so is the book of Mormon. It's another revelation of Jesus Christ. This will help you to grow in Christ uh, just as much as the Bible will. So the Book of Mormon, we're going to use that, and we're also going to use the Pearl of Great Price. That's, a, that's another source of authority, divine authority. So we're not rejecting the Bible. We're just going to take these other things along with it. Well, dear friends, uh, most evangelicals would see the dangers in those two examples. 
but they don't really see the danger in the Enneagram. And yet the Enneagram is exactly that same thing. The Enneagram is being regarded as another source of revelation, another source of authority. Um, evangelicals who use the Enneagram, they're not saying we reject scripture. They would never say that, but they're saying, but this will also help. This is another source of revelation. This is a another tool that the Holy Spirit can use. And you'll hear that actually here in just a few minutes. So I want to give you a few verses, though, to kind of uh, put some arrows in your sola scriptura quiver. All right. So let's start with a few. Um, Mark chapter seven, verses six through nine. And he, Jesus, said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commands of men. Leaving the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. And this, dear ones, is exactly what the Enneagram does. It is holding up something that is manly, not in the masculine way, but of of men, worldly, uh, the, the traditions of man, the philosophies of man, holding those things up as doctrine, as theology, as a, another source of authority. That is exactly what the Enneagram does. And Jesus condemned that very thing. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Paul writes, Now these things, brothers, I have applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you might learn not to go beyond what is written, so that no one of you will become puffed up on behalf of one against the other. The Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians and he warns them. He says, Do not go beyond what is written. In other words, do not exceed biblical parameters. And when we exceed biblical parameters, dear ones, we are actually opening ourselves up to demonic influence and demonic suggestion. We are opening ourselves up to pride. And Paul says that you are not to exceed what is written so that you won't become puffed up on behalf of one against another. Because uh, exceeding biblical parameters, going to other sources of biblical of authority outside of Scripture, uh, that will lead to you becoming arrogant, becoming puffed up. And we're actually going to see that very thing in, uh, in a clip here in just a minute from this pastor of a large evangelical church. So do not exceed what is written. Do not go beyond what is written. The Enneagram absolutely goes beyond what is written to us in Scripture. In what may be the most important text supporting sola scriptura is 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, who is a pastor. He says, all scripture is God breathed and is profitable for teaching. That's the word for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. Dear friends, there it is right there. All of God's word, all of scripture is breathed of God, is theonoustos in the Greek, God breathed. And it is profitable for, for doctrine, for theology, for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for instruction, training in righteousness, so that we may be complete, not partially complete, thoroughly complete, thoroughly equipped, Paul says, for every good work. Dear friends, Scripture is all we need. Scripture itself, which is inspired by God, says that it is all we need to be thoroughly equipped, not for most good works, not for some good works, but for every good work, everything that we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that we need to know about the gospel, about the state of man, about salvation, about repentance, about sanctification, about justification, about uh, ecclesiology, how to do church, uh, qualifications for elders, for eschatology, for, for uh, reconciliation between uh, sinning Christians, uh, Christians who have sinned against each other. And that does happen. Everything that we need, it's all found 
right in the Word of God. Everything that we need to know about ourselves, everything that we need to know about others, everything that we need to know about the fallen state of man, everything that we need to know about Christians and church and how to do church, everything is in Scripture. We are thoroughly equipped for every good work through the Word of God. But the Enneagram says, oh, no, no, no. Scripture is good, but it's not enough. Scripture is helpful, but it's not enough. You see, the Enneagram can, can help you to understand yourself better. It can, it can aid you in becoming a better person. It can aid you in learning how to uh, heal broken relationships. It's another source of truth. Just like the Book of Mormon is another source of truth. This is prima scriptura. It's not sola scriptura. And yet the Bible, God's inspired word, affirms sola scriptura. So I want to move now to some of the clips that I promised you would be coming. This is from a man named Matt Brown. And Matt Brown is the pastor of Sandals Church in Riverside, California. And uh, I don't know a great deal about this church. I, I do know it's it's rather seeker sensitive and uh, kind of loosey goosey around some things, but they have a, a number of satellite locations. So it's kind of a, a franchise, if you will. And they have other pastors, I think 13 different locations, but he is the, the pastor of kind of the, the mother church of, of Sandals Church, Riverside, California. And he is a heavy, um, just a very enthusiastic proponent of the Enneagram, and he has taught a series of sermons on the Enneagram, has done several interviews on the Enneagram. So uh, I found one such interview, and I want you to watch a few clips here. I'm going to play you a few clips, and then I will respond and offer a few comments. Um, I think what makes Sandals Church unusual is our vision. Mm -hmm. Our vision is not every church's vision. So our vision is to be real with ourselves, to be real with God, and to be real with others. So the Enneagram helps us meet our church's vision, to be more authentic, to be more connected with ourselves, to be more mm -hmm. connected with each other, and ultimately to be more connected with God. So Matt says that our church's vision is not every church's vision. Well, it should be because every church is headed by Christ. So it's not about my church or your church or his church. It is about the church of Christ and not a denomination. That's not what I'm talking about, but Christ's church. He is the head of the church. He sets the vision, to use that term. Our purpose as Christians when we meet together for corporate worship is to worship God, to worship Christ, to glorify Him. How do we do that? We do that through singing. We do that ultimately through the preaching. And then uh, through the preaching, we as believers are equipped unto every good work. And we go out into the world and we are salt and light and we evangelize, we share the gospel, we do missions, and by God's grace, people are converted and they come into the church and they join us in worship, worshiping Christ. That is That should be the vision of every church. So that's a fundamental problem. And, and then he says that uh, the Enneagram helps us to meet our church's vision and ultimately to be more connected with God. So the Enneagram helps us to meet our vision, to be more connected with God. So you see, Scripture is not enough. And yet, we just read in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, that Scripture is enough for the man of God to be complete, thoroughly equipped to every good work. But no, no, we need the Enneagram to help us do that. And I have not found a tool, and that's all that the Enneagram is, is a tool mm -hmm. to help us be more honest with ourselves. So Matt says that he has not found a tool that helps us to be more honest with ourselves uh, in a better way other than the Enneagram. So the Enneagram is the, is the most effective tool that he's ever found to help him to be honest with himself. Okay, a couple of points. So you hear this word tool, Enneagram is a tool, much like uh, critical race theory was adopted as a helpful analytical tool by the Southern Baptist Convention in their, con in their convention back in uh, 2019. So, uh, so we've got to, you know, we've got to go to outside sources outside of scripture for uh, more authority, for more truth, because the Bible, you see, is just not enough. And, and the most effective tool that he's ever discovered 
to help him be honest with himself and about who he is, is not the Bible. It's the Enneagram. What an insult to the Word of God. Dear friends, you and I have everything that we need to know everything about ourselves in the Word of God. The Word of God tells us who we are. It tells us that we are sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, it tells us what sin is. Roman, Romans 5.8, uh, God Paul says that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3 tells us that we were all by nature children of wrath, all deserving of the wrath of God because of our sin and the wages of sin, according to Romans 6.23, is death. Uh, it tells us that we are alienated, we are enemies of God. So the Bible tells us everything that we need to know about ourselves and our state before God, not the Enneagram. You see, this is prima scriptura, not sola scriptura. And so the Enneagram, I think, helps you in that way. Is it the Bible? No. Mm -hmm. Should it be considered on par with the Bible? No. Yeah. So every evangelical will have to say this. They'll say, you know, is it the Bible? No. Is it on par with the Bible? No. But what they, what they give with one hand, they take back with the other. Because when you think about this logically, here's what he's saying. No, it's not the Bible. It's not on the par with the Bible. But it will do things for you that the Bible just can't. You see the, you see the logical fallacy there? You see the logical problem? No, it's not as good as the Bible. But it will help you in ways, it's more able to help you in ways that, than the Bible is. It can do things for you that the Bible just can't. That doesn't work, dear friends. Yeah, I, I would say that even if you're not for the Enneagram or you're thinking like, oh, what is this? What we're doing when we use the Enneagram as a tool to get us a place is it's giving us an opportunity to talk about the danger of anger, hmm. of um, pride, of lying, of envy, of selfishness, of fear, you know, all of the downsides of that. Those are all biblical things that are sinful and destroying in our relationships. So Tammy says that the Enneagram gives them the opportunity to talk about the danger of anger, pride, lying, envy, selfishness, and all these other sins. Gives them the opportunity to talk about these sins. Does the Bible not do that? Well, of course it does. The Bible talks about all of those sins and then some. I mean, read through the book of Proverbs. Uh, read Romans, Romans chapter 1, for example. Let me read to you a couple of, just a couple of verses from one chapter from one book, Romans chapter 1. Beginning in verse 28, Paul writes, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to an unfit, a depraved mind, to do those things which are not proper having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, violent, arrogant, boastful, they're proud, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. The Bible talks about all of these sins and then some. But according to those who promote the Enneagram, the Bible's not enough. No, we need the Enneagram to help us see our shortcomings, a.k.a. sins. So we need to really push past symbols and really ask, okay, what is the Enneagram about? You know, this is about Jesus Christ dying for my sin. The Enneagram is a symbol that helps me become aware of my sin. Where, mm -hmm. where do I sin? Because most Americans don't think they're sinners. Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, I don't have a hard time getting people to believe in Jesus. I have a hard time getting people to believe in their sin. So in that clip, Matt says that the Enneagram helps me become aware of my sin. I don't have a hard time getting people to believe in Jesus. I have a hard time getting people to believe in their sin. So he says he has a hard time getting people to believe in their sin. What does he think the Ten Commandments are all about? The moral law of God. That is exactly what brings people to a, an understanding that they are sinners. If you've ever watched Ray Comfort and how he does evangelism, what does he do? He takes the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, and he goes up to people, man on the street interviews, and uh, I do a lot of this myself. And um, yeah, everyone, uh, almost everyone will proclaim their goodness. I mean, you go up to 100 people at random, ask them if they're a good person, 
99, if not 100 of them will tell you, yeah, I'm a good person. Because what they tend to do, or what we all tend to do, is we tend to evaluate our goodness by comparing us to other people. But you see, God does not evaluate our goodness by comparing us to other people. He evaluates our goodness by comparing us to himself. And he is the standard of goodness. There is only one who is good, and that is God. So how do we define goodness? Well, God defines goodness, and he does that specifically in the Ten Commandments. So go through the Ten Commandments. Ask someone, are you a liar? Well, yeah, we're all liars. In fact, the Bible says that. Let God be true and every man a liar. So you are a liar. You who are watching me right now, you're a liar. So am I, because we've all lied. Uh, thou shalt not steal. If you have taken anything that does not belong to you, you're a thief. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If you've ever used God's name in an irreverent way, that's blasphemy. And by the way, we take God's name in vain not only in what we say, not only in just saying like O-N-G or something like that. We take God's name in word and in deed. Um, thou shalt not commit adultery. And don't let yourself off the hook too quickly. Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. So if you've ever looked at another person with lust, guess what? You're an adulterer. So uh, go through the commandments. Go through the moral law of God. That is what brings us to an uh, acknowledgement that we are sinners. It is the law of God that does that. In fact, uh, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, he says, Therefore, the law... God's moral law, the law has become our tutor unto Christ so that we may be justified by faith. So what does God use to bring as our tutor, as our instructor that brings us to Christ? It brings us to the point that we understand that we are sinners in need of a savior. The law does that. God's moral law, the Ten Commandments, not the Enneagram. And so many of these people who are so anti, you know, Enneagram are just unhealthy ones. And, and here's the thing is people say, well, the Enneagram is cultic. And yes, it, it, it is. It can be. But mm -hmm. so is the church. And, you know, before the Enneagram, it was self-help. Pastors were completely against, listen to these words, self-help. Why wouldn't you be for people helping themselves? Wow. Okay. So there's quite a bit to unpack there. Matt Brown says that people who are anti-Enneagram are unhealthy. And yet elsewhere in this interview, he said that uh, this is good for his church and other churches. But, you know, if you don't want to do it, maybe it's not for your, maybe it's not your thing. Maybe it's not a, a, a good thing for your church, but it is for our church and many, many other churches. So he says that, but then he turns around and says, people who are anti-Enneagram are unhealthy. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm anti-Enneagram. Every speaker in this conference is anti-Enneagram. Everyone who affirms sola scriptura should be anti-Enneagram. So I guess we're all unhealthy. Well, thanks for that. And then he says that any, it's a, an amazing statement. He says the Enneagram is cultic. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is cultic as other speakers in this conference will make crystal clear. Yes, it is actually cultic. He says the Enneagram is cultic, but yeah, so is a church. What? The church is cultic? The church is the bride of Christ. Christ died for the church. Uh, that is just a, a shocking thing to say that the church is, is cultic. Unbelievable. And then he says this, why wouldn't you be for people helping themselves? So he admits that the Enneagram is all about self-help and he derides those who, who um, are against or look upon self-help with skepticism. Well, we should all look upon self-help with skepticism because it is a profoundly unbiblical concept. Dear friends, the whole point of the gospel is that we cannot help ourselves. You see, apart from Christ, we're not spiritually sick. We're spiritually dead. Tag on the toe, dead. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. There is nothing that we can do for ourselves. That is the whole point of the gospel. If you want some kind of self-help, then read a psychology book. Go to a, what's his name, Tim Robbins, Tony Robbins, whatever. Um, you know, it, one of these 
motivational speaker conferences, which will give you a little, maybe a little shot in the arm and make you feel good about yourself, but it'll be a sugar rush. It won't last. Um, the gospel is not about self-help. That is self-help is the most antithetical thing to the gospel that there is. We can't help ourselves. That is the whole point of the gospel. Christ helps us. And by the way, you've heard, oh, God helps those who help themselves. No, he doesn't. That Not only is that not in the Bible, it's not a biblical concept. God helps those who understand that they cannot help themselves. The Enneagram helps me to see where my giftedness lies, um, where my weaknesses lie, and it really, really, I think, ultimately will help set you free. Some people don't want to be set free. They want to live in the cloud. They want to be clueless to themselves, and they just want to plow through life. So Matt says that the Enneagram helps him to see where his strengths and weaknesses lie. So the Enneagram helps him do that and will help you do that, help you to know yourself, to know where your strengths and your weaknesses lie. So you need to, to invest yourself in the Enneagram, know which number that uh, you are and all this kind of stuff. And so you can understand yourself better, know your strengths and your weaknesses. You know what, dear friends, I'm 49 years old. I've never taken the Enneagram evaluation. I don't even know what number on the Enneagram I am. And you know what? I don't care. Uh, and neither should you. Uh, I've made it 49 years without knowing anything about uh, where I fall on the Enneagram. Uh, I know what my strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, by God's grace, from what people tell me, uh, I have the gift of teaching. I enjoy teaching. Um, I think, again, by God's grace, that he has borne some fruit through my preaching and my teaching as I've gone around all across the United States and around the world. Um, I think that is a, a strength of mine. I also know what my weaknesses are. Uh, for one thing, well, Kathy has helped me to know what some of my weaknesses are. Nothing like marriage will help you do that better. Uh, but uh, yeah, and she's told me and she's right. You know what? I can be too trusting of people. Sometimes I'm too trusting of people and that's burned me before. So, you know, I, I have a pretty good grasp, I think, on what my strengths and my weaknesses are. And I don't need the Enneagram and neither do you. Um, but on Judgment Day, we're going to be held accountable for, for what we really did, not what we believed we did. And so I think the Enneagram helps you to get real now. So you're not getting real for the first time on Judgment Day. Mm. Wow. So Matt says that you need to get real with yourself so that and the Enneagram will help you get real with yourself so that you're not getting real for the first time on Judgment Day. Are you serious? So he said you don't want to go and stand before God on Judgment Day without being well versed in the Enneagram. That is a shocking statement. I actually had to back that up and listen to it three different times. I wanted to make sure I was hearing him correctly, and I, and I was. That's what he said. So the Enneagram apparently is massively important. Don't you dare die and stand before God on Judgment Day without knowing all about the Enneagram. Dear friends, that is a stunning statement. You know what? Uh, I know some about the Enneagram now uh, because I've read some on it. I've, of course, done this presentation, and uh, I'm glad I know something about it, but not because I think it will benefit me on Judgment Day. I'm glad I know something about it, and these other speakers know something about it, so that they can warn you to stay away from this stuff, to stay away from this occultic, worldly philosophy disguising itself as something that will help you in your walk with Christ. It will not. But according to Matt Brown, you don't want to go to Judgment Day without knowing about the Enneagram. Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know what, dear ones? One day when I die and I stand before God on Judgment Day, uh, I have nothing to fear in an eschatological sense. I have nothing to fear in a wrathful sense. Because I, I know something about the Enneagram? No. Because I'm in Christ Jesus. Because God has granted me faith in repentance from sin. That's why I can stand before God without 
fear on Judgment Day, knowing that he will accept me. Not because I know anything about the Enneagram, but because I've been saved. And we're, we're asleep to ourselves. We're asleep to who God's really made us. And the Enneagram can help. The Holy Spirit can use the Enneagram to help awaken you. Okay, the Enneagram is not the end. You're the end. So Matt says that the Holy Spirit can use the Enneagram. And the Enneagram is not the end. You're the end. Okay, dear friends, we are not the end. God is the end. You see, the Enneagram gets you to look inward, gets you to look at yourself. Uh, and in fact, I want to show you this picture. I, this is a screenshot from another interview that Matt and his wife Tammy did on the Enneagram. And uh, look at the look at what's in the middle right there between the two of them. You see that? You. Yep. You see, the Enneagram is all about you. But dear, friend, dear friends, you are not the end. I am not the end. God is the end. You see, anything that gets us to look inward, that gets us to look inward to ourselves in some kind of self-help, that is antithetical to the gospel. We are not to look inward. We are to look outward. Not to look inside ourselves. We are to look out to God, out to Christ. The only source of truth is not inside of us. It is outside. It's not internal. It's external to us. The Word of God. Jesus says, Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Nothing else, not the Enneagram. And how is it that the Holy Spirit, emphasis upon holy, would use something that is inherently not holy, that you use something that is external to God, that is, that is outside of his truth, to somehow sanctify us in the truth? That makes no sense. How would the Holy Spirit use something that is cultic and worldly to help us as Christians? We are to be, we are as Christians, we are called out of the world. We're in the world, but we are not of the world. And so how in the world would the Holy Spirit use something that is worldly to sanctify us when we are not of the world? We are to be separate from the world, distinct from the world. So that just, that makes absolutely no sense. And here's another question. Um, riddle, riddle me this, Batman. So it wasn't until six or seven years ago that the Enneagram was even known to Christians. It was in some Roman Catholic circles, but uh, aside of that, it was, it was in the realm of the occult and new age and all this other kind of stuff that's distinctly anti-Christian. So, so here's my question. For the last 2,000 years, has, has the church been handicapped because it, it didn't know anything about the Enneagram? Have, have we been hamstrung as Christians? Have we be, been rendered uh, ineffective? Because up until the last few years, no Christian knew anything about the Enneagram. So have we as Christians for the last 2,000 years been ill-equipped to carry out God's will for our lives, to carry out the Great Commission, to, to do church, to understand ourselves, to understand each other, to understand God? Have, have we all been ill-equipped? Because it wasn't until the last few years that any, any of us knew anything about the Enneagram. Well, I guess so. I guess so. So for the last 2,000 years, the church has just, you know, it is just somehow scraped along but boy it, it's just uh it's really made a mess of things and if oh if we had just known about the enneagram so how how did the how did the protestant reformation happen without the enneagram how did the the great awakening the first great awakening the second great awakening how, how did that ever happen without the enneagram how did how did men like uh, George Whitfield and Charles Spurgeon and uh, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, how did how did these great men of God preach the gospel with such power? And how did how were so many millions of people converted? How did how was the gospel recovered from the the distortion that uh, it had been that had been wrought upon it by the Roman Catholic Church for for so many centuries? How, how did any of this happen without the Enneagram? 
You see, friends, it does not make any sense. Just, just a little common sense will go a long way in clearing this stuff up, will go a long way in, in helping us to realize, you know what? We don't need the Enneagram. How did the Holy Spirit do his work, you know, up until just the last few years when people started discovering the Enneagram? No, the Bible says we are thoroughly equipped unto every good work. We have the Bible. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. And again, that's what I would say to so, so many true. of these people. And what makes me so sad is so many people that are so diametrically opposed to the Enneagram are the ones who need it the most. Mm -hmm. They need it the most. They're abusive. They're angry. They're legalistic. So once again, we see Matt Brown trying to have his cake and eat it too. He says that uh, the Enneagram may not be for every church, but it's for our church and many other churches. But then he turns right around and says, those who are opposed to the Enneagram, most opposed to it are those who are most in need of it. And he says they are the ones who are <laughs> abusive, angry, and legalistic. Well, um, I'm pretty sure I'm not abusive. I'm pretty sure none of the speakers in this conference are abusive. And yet we would all are all very much opposed to the Enneagram. Uh, are we angry? No, I don't think we're angry. The only anger that I and the other speakers in this conference would have and that any of us would have as it relates to the Enneagram is simply a righteous anger at false doctrine, at false teaching. And uh, there is a place for anger, for righteous indignation in the Christian. In fact, one of the marks of our progressive sanctification, growth in Christ, is that we love what God loves and we hate what God hates. Uh, in fact, we are to hate every false way, right? We are to hate that which God hates. So um, there is a, a place for anger, but not at, at individuals, but at false doctrine, false teaching. And that's, that's what is going on here. And uh, we, Paul tells us in Titus chapter one, verse nine, we are to teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict, right? Teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. So warning about the dangers of Enneagram is not a reflection of any kind of sinful anger. It's actually an expression of love. Because uh, true Christian love, uh, love, when we see someone in danger, love acts on that. Uh, if you see someone who is in danger and say nothing, that is what hatred is. The most loving thing we can do for someone is to tell them the truth. The most loving thing we can do for someone who is in danger in going the wrong way spiritually is to warn them about that danger. That is what love does. Hatred is when you see someone in spiritual danger going the wrong way and you know the truth, but you don't tell them. If you really want to hate somebody, do that. In warning you about the dangers of the Enneagram, this is actually an expression of Christian love. What do you say to the people that argue um, the Enneagram is unbiblical and it came from the occult? Like, what, how have you guys thought through that? A lot of people mm -hmm. um, freak out about it's the rumors of origins or whatever. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, where did math come from? Where did science come from? I mean, there's all kinds of things, you know, who developed plastic? Was it a Christian? I mean, I don't know. Um, the question is not where did it come from? The question is what can it do? Is it, is it, 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 can it do something good for me or is it going to do something bad for me? So the question posed was, what do you say to those who say that the Enneagram comes from the occult and, and has its cultic origins and therefore it can't benefit us? And then Matt Brown responded by saying, well, well, where's math come from? Where does science come from? And uh, he said, it doesn't matter where something comes from. What matters is, is can it benefit me? Well, I would submit to you that it does matter where something comes from. Uh, Jesus said that a good tree bears good fruit. Bad tree bears bad fruit, right? A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Now, Jesus was talking about individuals, but uh, a, a, a loose application of that is certainly valid here because the Enneagram is a, a bad tree. It has bad roots. And so it's not going to bear and is unable to bear 
good fruit in our lives because uh, we're talking about spiritual matters. And so something that has a, a, a bad root system and is a bad tree is not going to bear good fruit. Yeah, I would, I, say, I would say your idol is safety at any cost. My idol is success at any cost. Mm -hmm. And you see how that, that can completely go. And, and, and so many critics of the Enneagram, right? They're a one, they're, they're purity of theology at any cost. So Matt says that the Enneagram has helped he and his wife to understand what their respective idols are. Uh, for his wife, her idol is apparently having protection or safety at all costs, and his idol is having success at all costs. And I kind of shuddered when I heard him say that because he apparently defines success by numerical growth. And his church, Sandals Church, does have 13 satellite campuses. So uh, by that metric, I suppose he has been very successful. But that is not how God defines success. Um, our success is measured by our obedience to God. That is, that is how God defines success, by our obedience. Your responsibility, my responsibility, is to study the Word of God and obey it. And we are to trust God for the results. We are responsible for the depth. God is responsible for the breadth. But at any rate, he says that those who oppose the Enneagram have the idol of purity of theology. An idol of purity of theology. Well, I guess in a sense, um, guilty is charged because the Bible tells us that we are to watch our doctrine and our life closely. That's what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16. Guard, take heed, watch your doctrine and your life closely because the, the purity of our doctrine has a direct effect on the purity of our lives before God. And uh, we are to study to show ourselves approved. And it is sound doctrine. It is right theology that deepens our knowledge of God. And when our knowledge of God is deepened, then that enables our love for God to be deepened. So that is a, a false dichotomy to pit uh, knowledge of God and love for God uh, in opposition to one another. They're, they're not opposed. They are their companions. Our knowledge of God and love for God are um, companions. They work together. So, dear ones, as I wrap up, warning about false doctrine, false teachers, false theology, that is a warning that is repeated literally dozens of times in the New Testament. In fact, 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament directly warn about false doctrine and or false teachers. Only the book of Philemon has nothing to say about those things, at least not directly. So 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament do. And it is not unloving to warn people about false doctrine, false teaching, worldly systems. Uh, it is not unloving to do that at all. In fact, it is the very expression of love to do that because it is a command given to us in Scripture. We are to mark those who cause divisions and hindrances contrary to the doctrine which you learn, Paul says in Romans 16, verse 17. We are to teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict, Titus 1, verse 9. So these, these commands, these warnings are all throughout Scripture. Let me give you an illustration that might help. If, if we are to see a blind man walking towards a thousand-foot cliff, who among us would see that and we would just sit back and think to ourselves, you know, um, I don't want to offend him. You know, I might hurt his feelings if I tell him he's going the wrong way. And, and uh, that would be very judgmental of me to tell him that he's going the wrong way. And so we just sit back and we say nothing and we watch that man fall off the cliff and plummet to his death. Would any of us do that? No, you wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Every single one of us, if we were to see a blind man walking towards a thousand foot cliff, we would be yelling at that man at the tops of our lungs saying, sir, stop. You're in great danger. You're going the wrong way. Turn around. Yet don't we do the very same thing, only far worse? 
with far greater consequences, spiritual consequences, when we see people going the wrong way spiritually, uh, and we know the truth, and we don't tell them. Friends, if you see someone going the wrong way spiritually, and you know the truth, and you don't tell them, that, those are potentially eternal consequences. The most loving thing we can do is to tell them the truth. If you really want to love someone, do that. Tell them the truth. If you want to hate someone, know the truth, but don't tell them. And dear friends, the truth is, is that we have everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness in the Word of God. Everything that we need is in God's Word, nothing else. Now, I want to address one objection because I know some people are probably thinking it. And uh, you can actually see the objection right behind me. Uh, some will say, well, how can you say that the Bible, you, we should never go to any sources outside of the Bible when you've got a bunch of shelves that are full of books that are written about the Bible. And those, those you know, I've got commentaries back there. I've got books and uh, books on preaching, books on theology, systematic theology, commentaries and Bible dictionaries and all that kind of stuff. And well, that those aren't the Bible. You're right. They're, they're not the Bible, but they were written by men who are gifted as teachers. And the gift of teaching is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, to edify the saints, edify the church. So there are men uh, in the body of Christ who have been gifted to teach the Word of God, and that is what those books represent. Um, do I take, for example, if I were to pull a commentary off of that shelf, uh, do I take it at face value? Do I believe it's on par with Scripture? No, but it is helpful to me because it is written about Scripture. Scripture is the subject matter, and it's written by someone who has been gifted by the Holy Spirit of God with the gift of teaching. We are still to read with discernment and test all things, hold fast to that which is good, per, per, per verse Thessalonians 5.21. Uh, but that represents a gifting in the body of Christ that God gives. Not so with the Enneagram. There's nothing Christian about the Enneagram. It does not have Christian origins. It has cultic origins. There is nothing godly about it. It is worldly, and it is, it is being introduced into the church. And that is explicitly condemned by Scripture. We have everything that we need in God's Word. Sola Scriptura, not Prima Scriptura. And so as I close, I just want to close real quickly with the gospel itself. Has there been a time in your life when you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit of God that you are a sinner, that you have broken God's laws? And just like we break laws on earth, there's a penalty to be paid. How much more so when we break the laws of God? But because we have sinned against God who is eternal, the punishment of that sin is also eternal. And if we die in our sins, we will very rightly, very justly go to a very real place that the Bible calls hell, where there will be wailing, weeping, gnashing of teeth. And if you die in your sins, that is what awaits you. And there is no amount of good works that you can do to overcome the debt of your sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Paul says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. If you die in your sins, you will spend eternity in hell. That's the bad news. But the good news of the gospel is this, is that God has made a way for you to escape his wrath. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. And Jesus lived a perfect life. The God-man, fully God, fully man. Jesus lived a perfect life to the perfect satisfaction of God. And Jesus willingly laid down his life on the cross. His life was not taken. He gave it. This perfect person offered his perfect life as a perfect sacrifice to perfectly satisfy the perfect wrath of God. Died on the cross three days later, bodily raised from the dead, proving himself to be who he said he was, God in human flesh. And if you will repent of sin, that means to turn from sin and place your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, he will save you. If you will come to Christ in what the Bible describes as a godly sorrow over your sin, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, a godly sorrow when you grieve over your sin because you understand that your sin has grieved God. 
and you do not want to grieve Him. But if you will come to Christ, grieving over your sin, acknowledging your sin, and you trust Him and ask Him to save you, He will. You will pass from death to life. And that is the good news of the gospel. Thank you so much for your time. I hope that this has been helpful for you. And I know that the rest of the conference will be very helpful to you as well. So thank you very much, dear ones. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all.